you know, carry on this uh, this series really because this uh, I'm not sure whether you guys are all aware or maybe you've attended the first presentation that I did for for Georgie uh, about a month and a half ago, which was the first of the the teaser basically telling us what genealogy generally is all about. Um, did anybody actually come into that presentation? Any of you guys attend that? Can you just Put your hand up or wave to me or give me a signal, two fingered salute, anything if you like, if you uh, if you were on that one. Or are we starting afresh? We're starting afresh, are we? Oh. No, I was. You were? That's that's great, thank you. So this is the second. So this is really continuing on from that first presentation in the sense that the first presentation was really about yeah, just getting your interest up, telling you what genealogy is generally all about without telling you how to do it or anything uh, of, of that nature. Now, today, we're going to start diving in a little bit deeper. And uh, as you can see, let me just flick over to my presentation and share this with you. If you can all see that, I hope. This is uh, the next step, basically. This is the, the start of the beginning because family research if you've uh, investigated or spoken to anybody uh, in uh, the family or friends that are doing genealogy research, you'll understand that this is uh, a long journey or can be a long journey. And that uh, I don't think it ever really stops. Any genealogist that probably says I've finished my family tree is probably telling a big hawky because I don't think you ever get to the point of uh, of finishing. So let's uh, let's press on. So my name is Gary, Gary Phillips. I'm um, involved with the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. I'm the educator. Join the meeting. Sorry, did someone say something? No? Um, I'm involved with the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. I'm the education officer there. NZSG is a national organisation. <laughs> we have international affiliations and we have access through our international affiliations for a whole lot of really interesting databases from both New Zealand, intensely New Zealand, of course, but also um, overseas. For, for example, if you want to research um, the, uh, the UK, you know, the English Times newspaper, all of the Times newspapers are digitised and online and accessible to us through our subscription through the New Zealand Society of Genealogists, as well as things like um, wills and probates and uh, you know, all family history databases through NZSG. So um, our organisation has a membership of around 4,000 odd people. It goes, comes and goes, as you appreciate. We, uh, we're we primarily focused on you know, membership is primarily the elderly people. And unfortunately, a few people fall off the perch every year and no longer able to renew their, uh, their membership. So come, membership does come and go, as all sorts of organisations do. We have lots of branches throughout the country, so it doesn't matter where in the country you might be, we're probably able to serve you through one of our branches, your local local interest groups on doing uh, family history, wherever it might be, or if you're interested in a particular subject area, it might be Irish or Scottish or whatever, there's a, an interest group set up to, uh, to help you with your research where you get problems um, in, in those areas as well. And of course, our head office, our family research centre at Panmure, uh, is online pretty much all of the all of the time through business hours to take phone calls and help people, and provide um, you know, research support as uh, as well. Uh, and we do a lot of online, as I do. I'm the education officer, so I do a lot of online work and face both face to face training, um, primarily around the uh, the Auckland region. Um, and our face-to-face -face training usually consists of a four-day course, four days of three hours a day, to try and get people uh, more intensely involved in, uh, in, uh, you know, educa in education and resourcing and researching all those little problems in your family that you've always wanted to know about. Um, and we have an online magazine, archives and electronic bus databases, all the things you would normally expect from a, a national organisation. And that's our website, genealogy.org.nz. So me, I've been a tutor and committee member of our Hibiscus Coast branch for more than six years. 
I've had now uh, on my introduction courses to family history, I've probably had more, that's a lie here, it says 150, probably had close to 200 people complete my family history introductory courses, the four day courses, where we get right inside it. And it's, this is family history month at the moment, August. I'm just in the middle of my third course for this month, just this month. And another one starting um, face to face at East Coast Base Library uh, at the end of this month, and that's an ongoing thing in terms of uh, of education. My backgrounds in business management, health and safety, process control, and and training and corporate management. <clears throat> <I've> been, <coughs> excuse me, I've been a member of the New Zealand Society for more than four years, and I do, as I said, a lot of the online tutoring. In fact, that's why I don't do a lot of it. I do all of it. At the moment, we're looking for people to back us up to uh, spread this load around. And I am the education officer. So when you ask for training through NZSG, you'll probably be directed to me. And I do a lot of community guest speaker work as well for clubs, retirement villages, um, groups like Rebus, Probus, those sorts of organisation, Rotary, Lions Clubs that are interested in fun, yeah, spreading the word a little bit about what... Uh, what's available for people. Um, question here is, are you self-taught? Most genealogists around nowadays have been self-taught. For a long time, there has not been any formal training really available to, uh, to people. And it has been an issue because when you're self-taught, you learn different things and it's in an unstructured way. And unfortunately, you can learn the wrong ways, not necessarily always the wrong way to do things, but the wrong way maybe to record how to uh, manage your, your files, the paper records that you develop when you're doing genealogy research. And if you learn the wrong way, it can be an awful job to come back and have to back up and start all over again. I was self-taught. I started back around 1995, and I wish I'd have known what I know now back in 90, 1995, that's for sure. Um, so I fit into the education group within the NZSG, and we're involved making sure that people get it right from the beginning. We have face-to-face uh, -face and online. We have the four-day family history introduction courses, and we have specialist courses on DNA, on the technical aspects of you know, computer use. It's a very technical business nowadays in terms of you know, using your computer to access the databases that are international. Um, and how to record that sort of information so you can produce reports that your family can sit back in awe and say, how did you find that? Where did you do that? Look at that report you've done. Because in the end, what we're trying to do in doing family research is to be able to show things to our family and say, did you know this is where you came from? These are your ancestors. You know, this is where the commonality and the traits, the family traits, whether it's a carpenter or a fitter and turner or whatever, that those traits continue down family lines. And sometimes you don't know where they actually come from. And I have to say that the um, more and more the prevalence of TV programs like the Who Do You Think You Are or the, uh, the David Lomas series for New Zealand bases have done uh, a lot of things as far as genealogy research, think, bringing things to the fore and showing people what you can actually find when you're, when you're doing research. If you look at David Lomas, it's a, it's a wonderful program. And um, in, in the end, let, let's get real about this, people. David Lomas is the front man that presents the information behind him. He has very good genealogist uh, researchers doing the hard yards on digging up all the details on these people and uh, presenting it to him in a form that he can actually use and make it into a, a TV program that basically you know, sells. So this is about our first steps. What do we do after we've decided to start doing some research and to try and get you on the path? So this is, uh, and. Please ask questions as we go here. If there's something that uh, is not clear for you, please uh, stop me, put your hand up, and uh, and we'll deal with it. So the first and primary step that you need to do is to discuss this with your family. You need to tell your family, and I'm not just talking your nearest kin, we're talking about your extended family, and tell them that you're going to start doing research or you are 
have been doing some and you're now trying to get a little bit more in depth on doing your research and start finding out what's actually available because there may well be things that have already been done. You don't know whether that second cousin that you haven't spoken to since last the last funeral or last wedding that you attended, whether they've actually documented some information about your family that you don't really know about if you're not discussing it with them. So being able to establish a an on, like an online blog, whether that's a Facebook user group within your family, your extended family, or a WhatsApp uh, messaging system to actually tell people where you can share and inform and find th these things out, it's something that's really, very important for you to do because you don't want to reinvent what's already been done. But I have to say that while you don't want to reinvent what has already been done, you also need to have the ability to check what has already been done because it may not have been researched properly and accurately and verified to the point that it is actually fact. And as a family historian, you people are basically carrying the can for your family to be able to tell your family, I have proven that this is the way that it was. This is what actually happened. And, uh, and be sure that you've got the information correct and not to you know, follow the family rumors that may be absolutely rubbish. So finding out what has already been done is, uh, is important to, uh, to know because you, if you find something that has already been done and that person is still alive that has created that research, then being able to share information with them can give you a buddy to be able to you know, cross-check the information with and make sure that what you're looking at is correct or what they actually looked at was right and you had it wrong. So it's good to have that discussion with, uh, with other people. And of course, you need to collect the records. I, I shudder every time I hear that someone went down, around to uh, a deceased estate or whatever and there was a box of stuff that was getting chucked out. Letters, Bibles, um, wills, um, photographs, anything like that. Those records are important historically in terms of documenting your family research. And I think we're all guilty of saying, oh, we don't want all of that paperwork hanging around. You know, and, and that might be fair as well. But being able to digitize it and keep it within, Join the meeting. within your computer system and using it properly uh, to make it available to other people and sharing it is a big part of what we actually do. So collecting those records um, yeah, in whatever way you can uh, is important. And some of these things clearly, you know, family trees that may have already been done, the family Bibles. We rate family, as a family historian, we rate family Bibles as being very high in uh, verified content. And the reason for that is clearly the family Bibles have documentation written inside the, the Bible that took place at that particular time. The person wrote it down when that child was born, when that marriage took place, when that person died. So you have a very high um, confirmation level of its accuracy, and we rate it very, very highly. And having copies of the Bibles, if you're not able to actually get hold of the original and keep it to yourself, ha having uh, copies of it in terms of photographs or scans is uh, really important. Letters, wills, land records, you know, where did they live? What did they own? What did they pay for that? You know, where did it get sold? All of those things. And of course, the birth, deaths and marriages certificates themselves. Um, and just a quick word on BDM certificates. Birth certificates, generally fairly reliable in terms of accuracy. Marriage certificates, similarly you know, because the people who are actually there at the time getting married are the ones that can certify that correctly. Death certificates notoriously can be inaccurate. And you always have to look at a death certificate and say, you know, who provided the information about this person that had actually died? And if it was a grandson or a second cousin who provided the information saying, you know, he was born on Ireland in 1832, may not have spent any time with him, understand really that he wasn't born on Ireland at all. It was in Scotland and it was 1845 or whatever. So accuracy of death certificates is always suspect and needs uh, verification. 
And of course, you need to read what's already out there within your family. Read the family letters, the family papers, you know, the uh, the transcripts, the books. If someone's actually produced a book um, about their you know travels to New Zealand or travels to another country doing research, these sorts of things, read them all thoroughly before you really get going. And this is an important one. You need to get a sense of any notable people that you might have within your family. And the reason for that is notable people, and by notable people, I mean, they may have been a mayor, they may have been um, a city councillor, someone that got into the newspaper, a doctor, a teacher of note, um, university professor, um, an MP, even if it was just a single term MP, um, those sorts of people in the days gone past before the electronic you know, social media, they were all reported in newspapers. And those newspaper reports of the events that the notable people attended, may, they were the social media reports of the day. And if a notable person that's in your family history attended an event, that event, that wedding, probably contained other family members of your family that you may not know anything about. So being able to search for the notable people may open up the roads to give you access to people that uh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe not so notable. The Joe the plumber, but he was at the wedding and he's recorded in the newspaper report alongside the, the local MP. And of course, notable people, frankly, they're quite easy to trace or they're easier to trace because they made the newspapers, we reported them, we tracked their obituaries and things like that. And then start a pedigree chart. And a pedigree chart is a simple chart that tells you where you are, your parents, what you know about your parents, where they were born, when they got married, what other children they actually had, and then their parents, your grandparents in turn, when they got married, and writing that all down in a you know, pedigree chart format, and there's plenty of pedigree charts online for you to have a look at if you don't know what pedigree chart is, um, gives you a, a, an idea of what holes you actually have in your families that you need to start concentrating on for your research. Because really, we want to spend the time on the things that we don't know about, rather than spending a lot of time on the stuff that we already really know. Okay, so we want to fight, fill in those holes on the pedigree charts as much as possible. And if you're talking about or considering a DNA test, don't make the mistake of seeing the ads on TV or wherever it might be about uh, DNA tests online and buying up um, for Christmas uh, a whole pack of uh, DNA tests and giving it to your grandchildren and saying, here, get your DNA tested. Because we already know what your grandchildren's DNA is. It was passed from you to your children and then down to them. What we don't know is the DNA that are your ancestors, your parents and your grandparents. And that means getting your DNA tested on your oldest living relative, if that's you, well and good. Um, or if it's a, a great aunt, that's excellent as well. Get them, if you're able to, to, uh, to complete a DNA test and get that recorded and tracked. So, and if, as a family historian, you're able to do that and use that DNA to then confirm in a lot of cases, some of the, uh, the family links that you may not have understood otherwise. And those oldest living relatives, they're the first people you need to go and talk to and interview and sit down and get written notes about what they knew about their family what their life was like, what they knew about their parents' lives. while they, And obviously, you've got to get them while they're alive. So you can't, once they're gone, you can't ask those questions. And if that's you, that's great. Make those notes for yourself. But if you've got another relative, whether it's a cousin, and I don't care whether it was a cousin that you've never spoken to for yonks, if you've got the ex you can get access to them to have a discussion with them, it's valuable information to record what they actually know because they will know other things that you don't. And that's what we want to know. Now, there are some sites here listed on the screen for you to have a look at. And I'll go quickly into some of these for you. 
these are free sites. So these um, are available online, no charge to access. The LDS site, the Latter-day Saints site, or commonly known as the Mormons, the Family Search. Let's just pop in here just quickly. Is it going to show me? Right, so this is what the Mormon site looks like. Now, all you need to be able to access this information within the Mormon site, and they've done extensive research throughout the world uh, on all birth, deaths, marriages, wills, you name it, uh, extensive records that they actually hold, and they've made it available to us online for free. All you need is a uh, registration. You need to register with your email address and a username and so it can track where you've been and what you've actually looked at. And the main reason for that is it wants to know what you've done. So down here, it's showing me my last time I logged in. There's my profile at the top. It tells me that I last looked for John Dooley, Thomas McGuire, James Dundas Sims, um, and where we go. That's tracked me. And so if I want to come back to this later and look at where I have been, the information is actually given there to me. And at the top of the screen up here, we've got several different drop down menus. To search, we can search all the records that they actually hold census records, birth, deaths, marriages, school reports, passenger lists, whatever, they're all listed here. We can look for other people's family tree. So if someone else has already done a family tree, and it might be a, a cousin or whatever of yours, if they've published a family tree and put that family tree out onto Family Search or any other website, um, we're able to actually look at it and see what information they actually have there, providing that information has been made public at the time it was published. You can publish a family tree online and make it private, so people can't actually see it all, but they can come to you and ask to have access to it. So researching, uh, just looking simply at records, then because this is an international site, we can search for all records throughout the world using this search, search criteria here, or we can search and narrow it down straight away by the place. So if we just type in there simply New Zealand, then it will show me all of the databases that Family Search, the Mormons hold for New Zealand records. And this is not ex extensive. This is not all of them. This is the list of the more common ones. So, for example, the most commonly used um, database on Family Search is for passenger listings. That is, all the records held within New Zealand archives have been digitized by the Mormons and made available on their website for us to go and have a look at. Now, don't get too excited, guys, because passenger records in New Zealand are notoriously remiss. We have big holes in what has been actually recorded or has been retained. So um, the New Zealand archives people, last time I was in Wellington discussing with the head archivist, they've told me that all the records that they hold in terms of passenger listings, that's the full manifest of passengers, have been digitized by the Mormons and made available through their website. So they did that for free for archives. In return, they've published it online. So you can go into passenger listings, very simply, enter the name details of uh, the person that you're actually trying to find out about, when did they arrive? And if it's some of the key criteria here, you can also make it a little bit more specific and add other details in like where were they born, when were they born, where were they married, or whatever, and then search for a particular person's name. Be aware, though, that spelling can be a little bit varied. Um, ages can be varied. So, for example, when there was a common misconception that if you were trying to come to New Zealand as an assisted immigrant, that you had to be under the age of 50 in order to qualify for assisted passage. Um, actually, not true. 
but that meant that common misconception meant that a lot of people falsified their age in order to get assisted passages. So while you might be looking at someone on the the, uh, the passenger listings that says, or that you know might have been 50 odd at the time they, they left and came to New Zealand, uh, on the passenger listings, they may actually be shown as only being 40 because they lied. And there was no proof at that particular time. So the passenger listings is just one of the sort of databases that's available. And if you want to climb inside all of the detail of the databases that are available on uh, the Mormon website, then going into the catalog listings, that's up here under search and catalog. This is like a library catalog looking at all of the different books on the shelf of the Mormon library that contain data. And simply, once again, putting in the name, New Zealand, country, location, selecting it, searching it. And here is all of the individual databases. So if you know that you're specifically looking for information about colonization, for example, you can go directly into the colonization database and it will only give you results from that databases. Now, some of the records on here on Family Search uh, may not be available directly online to show you. Many, many of them are, but some of them may require you to go to a, an LDS or Mormon Church certified or affiliated library search center. That can be uh, the local Mormon Church. Most of the the, uh, the the churches actually have a uh, a support center set up about research, or it could be your local library that is the uh, is an affiliated library with the Mormon Church that will give you access to information that might be otherwise hidden to you as Joe Public. So just be aware of that. Sometimes it'll pop up; it'll show you something on the screen and say, "Go to an affiliated library or family research center to." view the certificate or document that you're looking for, that might simply mean all you need to do is to go to your local library to be able to log in there to see this particular information. So it's very extensive. And you can see here there's pages and pages of the different databases just for New Zealand. Now, if I'd have asked for England records within Family Search. We'd be looking, we'd be spending five minutes just talking about English records, just pages and pages. So, you know, New Zealand records are quite specific and relatively easy to, uh, to figure out where you might want to look in a bit more detail. Okay, any questions on that? No? Well, okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's go back and come out of family search and go into another free site that I think you might get a little bit excited about, and it's called Papers Past. This is part of the National Library. So thank you, Mr. Taxpayer, that's paid for this, because now you have access to digitized newspapers, right through, oh, the dates vary, but generally from go right through to around the 1950s or 60s, depending upon what the, uh, what the paper was, and it's progressively being digitized all of the time. Um, so if we just look simply at newspapers here, we can look at um, the title of a newspaper and just see what was there. The Auckland Times published from 1842 to 1846, so very restricted time frame. Um, the Auckland Examiner, the Ashburton Herald, and we can either go specifically into that particular newspaper if you want to look at that particular newspaper by itself, or we can search all newspapers. Oops, let me just close that and come back to the full search screen. Come back, come back, going slow. Back here. And then we can just put on the name of the person that we're actually researching. Um, so if it's Joe Smith, we would type in Joe Smith and we could say Joe and Smith. I want all of the words Joe and Smith together in an article to give me the results showing on the screen. Or I want specifically the phrase 
Joe Smith or Mrs. Smith or whatever first names, last name it may be, and it will only record those particular um, criteria that you're actually putting in. Then we can select it by date, what period of time we're actually interested in looking for, what region that newspaper may have been published. Was it a national newspaper? Was it just the Hawke's Bay area newspapers? And just search within those areas. And we can also select the type of content that we might be looking for. Are we looking for an article, birth, deaths and marriages, a family notice or things like that, or an advertisement if it may have been a shop owner or someone that owned a business, or a photograph or a, uh, an illustration that's there. And the uh, search criteria that we actually select there will actually then display on the screen for you. And you can then uh, do a snip and click of uh, what's on the screen, or you can download that article or that photograph, whatever it may be that's showing to you, directly off uh, papers past. In a similar sort of way, the Australian newspapers uh, Trove is available to us online for free. Um, in the UK, you're going to start paying for uh, for that sort of access, but still um, you know, available if you're getting into serious sort of research. So Papers Past is a very powerful um, device because it's recording the social history of the days that we're interested in. So if you're talking about trying to research notable people to see what happened, putting in the names of those notable people in here and searching within the, the home patch of those people, whether it's Ashburton or Wellington or wherever it may be, and getting the details of every time they went to a social event and were reported, then you're getting all of the information about they went there. Mrs. Jones went to Wellington for the weekend. She came back and was visiting her daughter while she was away. So we get the name of Mrs. Jones and the daughter's name. She was actually then living in Wellington. So we get the details of when they were alive and where they potentially lived to carry on our research journey. So Papers Past is a, um, is a very good tool. Birth, deaths and marriages in New Zealand. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this particular site as well. So this is where you would order up or research the details of historical people. And there are criteria here for searching the, the birth, how old people uh, may have been, 100 years or more, you're able to access the information, or if it was a deceased person or a stillbirth or a marriage more than 75 years. So there are specific criteria in terms of making information available, all limited by the, uh, the Privacy Act for you. And then you can search for birth, um, and criteria, putting in the actual family name, given names, spelling specific. So if you don't know the uh, the correct spelling of a name, there are wild cards that can be entered here to actually overcome any spelling deficiency. So if you're getting lots of answers coming back, you may say, I need to be you know, clear about how this may have been spelt. And then simply look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the help to find out how to spell or how to use wildcards within uh, New Zealand birth, deaths and marriages. In a similar sort of way, you can look at um, UK uh, research online, but only up to the point of uh, indexing. That will give you volume and page number of a, of a book, and then you have to go and order the certificate. In the same way here on the New Zealand uh, BDM, this will only give you the information to enable you to order online, receive a certificate online through email, but pay the money, honey. You're not going to get it for free. Okay. Um, Archives New Zealand, this is another free site. And Archives New Zealand contains um, a lot of historical information, um, wills, criminal events, land sales records in the days of the Second World War when land sales all had to be registered, that all those registrations were managed through the High Court and were recorded through archives. So if you're looking for land sales transactions during that period, you'll find those records will be available through archives. And then searching is a, a relatively simple matter to, uh, to go through. 
And when it refreshes, it'll give me the uh, the information. It'll come up here, hopefully, if it ever gets going. So what are you looking for? And then you can just type in the name of the person or the particular location that you might be searching for. So we've got things like probated wills, coroner's reports, um, civil action uh, legal suits, um, land sales, registration of all the suffragette movement, all recorded here to, to get names of people. Um, a, a vast you know, gamut, a huge amount of information available through archives and all available for free. So it's just a case of what are you actually looking for and understanding the search criteria that you need to put in to start getting information back. And then um, other websites, the Wilson Collection is a lady who was a, an NJSG member for many years and collated an awful lot of information and put it together, created a website for free uh, for people to be able to search their New Zealand history records. And searching in the uh, Wilson Collection Index will once again give you access to a vast range of information, birth, deaths and marriages uh, primarily, but also in some cases things like school records and things like that as well. So Wilson Collection is another free one that's generally available for you. Okay. So those are the free sites. You can spend your time perusing those and having a look around and seeing what's actually there. But once you then start to find things, what do you do? Because now we need to start recording the information. There's not much point in, well, you can, if you're happy to just cruise around and just look, th look things up without having to do anything else with it, then that's fine. Knock yourself out. But if you're going to get serious about trying to record and documenting and telling the rest of your family how wonderful you are and how many things you've actually found, then you want to start putting it into a computer system that will actually record this for you. Now, there's a couple of ways of actually doing this. You can document all of your records online using websites like Ancestry, like using the Mormon Church website. You're able to, once you've got a profile set up, you're able to add your family tree information in there. Or you can use a computer system of your own uh, on your laptop uh, that will record uh, all this information that you then choose to publish at some stage in the future. When you're comfortable with knowing it's accurate and you're able to share it, then that's what you uh, can do. And there's some very good software around that will record on your computer directly. And whether it's a, an Apple that you're actually running or a, micro, or a Microsoft Windows machine, the software for all of them. And some examples here are Legacy, that's the program that I run, Roots Magic, another very common one, and Family Tree Maker, which is another very, very common one. Um, and these are all available at a relatively low cost. I think Legacy is about $60 or something to purchase outright, but it also runs a free version um, that's a stripped down, low feature set, but gives you the basic information available. So if you wanted to try things out, these programs quite often will give you a, a trial version for free to get you to understand how it actually works. And is it going to do the sorts of things that you want it to be able to do? They all do the same sorts of basic things very well. They're well-developed, well-maintained, um, and quite user-friendly. Once you start to use these things, then of course, it's like the bank, you know, once you set up a relationship with a bank, it's uh, not hard to change, but you're less likely to change it. Something's got to be a real catalyst to get you to, uh, to change a bank. And the same sort of thing. So once Legacy hooks you in and gives you the trial version and get comfortable with it, you're unlikely to go somewhere else. You'll probably continue to use Legacy and ultimately you'll buy the full featured set version because you want to do some reports that um, you know, I mean, you can show stuff to your family and make yourself look really cool. Um, so with these programs, they're all relatively easy to get started on. There are some excellent tutorials for all of them online, whether that's tutorial that comes with the purchase of the machine or through YouTube online to actually show you how to do these things. Um, they're really very comprehensive. And if you do go down this path and set up software on your machine, on your laptop, 
then one of the things I do recommend you do is to set up a sand pit. A sand pit is a family tree, really, that you can play with. So all of these programs will allow you to have several different family trees all running at the same time. The idea of a sand pit is let you muck it up. You want to go in there, start doing things, and be comfortable with the idea it doesn't matter whether I get it wrong because it's only a sand pit. I can scrub out the sand, broom over the top, and start again without any problem. So setting up a, a sand pit is a really good idea if you're getting going you know, right at the beginning and you don't know an awful lot. And you may not have access to people that can support you directly. But that's one of the things you actually look for when you're actually making a purchasing decision on, on software. You know, where do I go for support? Is there a local user group within the local NZSG branch? the local family history society that can help me, you know, when you get stuck on something, help me understand how this can work. Okay, and then you trial. You trial your software. Do the data entry. Get the name spellings wrong. Look at the reports. Produce reports, sample reports on what you've actually already put on your sand pit. Look at the error messages. Understand what the error messages actually mean because sometimes it'll be coming back and saying, you want to check the date on this because she was actually 60. According to your information, she was actually 60 years old when this child was born. Do you really think that was the case? Double check. So it gives you hints about where you may have already gone wrong and got wrong information. And one of the other things that you need to do now, you're going to have a lot of information coming at you. Information that you'll um, get from the on-site, uh, uh, the online websites, the family searches or the ancestries or whatever. And when you download load this information, a newspaper report out of papers past, when you download that information, you want to set up a file name convention to save it on your computer in a name that's meaningful for you to be able to find all over again. So establishing a file naming convention Putting it up on the wall so when you do something else again you're going to follow the same convention to follow the same file naming so you can find that sort of thing uh, again and be consistent about what you're doing um, this is the story of do what i say not what i do <laughs> because i've been down this path and had to rechange um, a lot of file naming because i decided after some time that I wasn't doing it in the most effective way and had to come back and actually you know, re-save a whole lot of documents to get them in the standard that I actually decided was going to work for me. If I'd have known this at the beginning, it would have saved me an awful lot of time and effort. And then, of course, you'll have other things as well. You'll want to file these. So giving it a file name is one thing, but knowing where you file it on your computer is something else again. So you will need to set up a filing system, whether it's under the family group names that you've actually got. So you've got all the data associated with one of your great grandparents or that family name is entirely up to you. But establishing a filing system is, uh, is very important as well. But you'll have a lot of paper as well, no doubt. Photographs that have been given to you by other family members, how you actually record the, the, uh, the photographs um, and file them in a filing cabinet or whatever you're going to do is also very, very important to do. And if they're you know, photographs, for example, that are the only photographs that's ever been made on that particular family or family event, that's valuable information. You want to make sure you're going to save it and use it you know, properly and save it uh, in a way you can get access to it. Step number four, this is where your money comes in. You're going to get what you pay for out of this. So firstly, all right, Facebook is free. And Facebook will give you access to local genealogy research groups. It'll give you access to um, the, the um, DNA support groups. It'll give you access to the legacy or ancestry or family tree maker user groups online internationally for you to um, get support or follow the thread of what people are actually talking about and understand how you can get the most out of your investment in the software or overcome the problems that you've actually got. 
in your in your research lines. So Facebook is a very very powerful and very useful tool. And I have to say, Facebook is um, an older person's um, social media of nowadays. The younger people tend to gravitate more into the Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and those sorts of things. But Facebook for us. Uh, in our age groups is a very useful tool to be able to use. It's quite user-friendly for these sorts of things and very powerful when you start climbing inside it. You should join um, either the New Zealand Society of Genealogists or the local branch, um, Family History Society, if there is a local branch, because you want to be able to talk to other people with you know, the same objectives that you have. You know, solve the same sort of problems that they're actually having. So sharing this information around and talking to you know, similar groups is very, very useful to, uh, to be able to do. Attend their meetings, go and listen to their guest speakers, get their newsletters, have a read of their newsletters, understand what's actually going on. It will help you on your research line. Genealogy is a huge subject matter in the very broadest sense of what is available. There is not one person of, around that knows everything about genealogy. We're all experts in different areas. And when you find a local um, genealogy uh, group that's useful to you, it might be the South Taranaki Family History Society, you follow the pages, the family, uh, the Facebook pages of that family history group to see the sort of flavour of the questions that are going back and forwards. What are they finding out? Who's who's raising the questions? Who's answering the questions? Look at the photos. Oh, that's a photo. That might be one of my relatives. And getting that uh, information. So you want to follow the pages of um, the the interest areas that you actually have. And of course, once you get inside some of these other websites, the ancestries or the family searches, whatever, you want to know when new databases come online. The databases are becoming more available every single day. More data, more data. So that means that what you may not have been able to find today in terms of your research, the record that you're actually looking for, might be available tomorrow because all of a sudden there is a new database section that comes available and put, put online. A new section of a newspaper, for example. So following what's new, the front page section of all your favorite search sites that you'll get to know, is important to read. What are they producing as new material? What do you need? Well, your mind is the most important thing that will drive this. All the other skills you can learn quite simply. An inquisitive searching mind, reading between the lines, um, is a, a very important criteria. You need basic computer skills and internet access. You can do it on an iPad, you can do it on a tablet, you can do it on a phone. I can't imagine why, because phones just won't give you big enough screens to see a lot of the material that you're looking for, but I know people that do it. Um, and you know, the internet access for so much of this material is just it gives you so much data, it's incredible. You need access to coffee and cake. And I don't say that lightly because this sort of stuff will suck you in or can suck you in to the point where you'll be looking for something at two o'clock in the morning and coffee and cake is the thing that will keep you going to keep that search to the end where you can say, ah, I found it. So coffee and cake is an important support tool for you. And you obviously need your jammies and your dressing gown because if you're up at 2 a.m., you know, that's what's going to happen. And you need that filing system set up, obviously. A printer and a scanner are important. And then we now we get into the where you pay your money, the subscription sites. Now, I caution you all right at the get-go about just sailing off and saying, oh, I should join Ancestry. It's going to cost me 250 bucks a year to join Ancestry. That looks like it's a good idea. I've seen all the advertising. You know, they're all over this. I'll, I'll join that one. Ancestry uh, is mostly available through the library system. Go into the library, take your laptop, log on to the library Wi-Fi, and pull up the Ancestry Library Edition. And the librarians will show you how to do that if you don't see it for yourself. So you can get access to the Ancestry records and databases simply by going into the library and accessing it. Same for my heritage 
Um, find my past. These are all the main sites. Genealogy.org, our, our uh, NZSG site, of course, is, uh, it's a subscription site, but you won't ever get access to it through the library. You have to pay your money to join the organization. And some of these sites are also available through the library system by remote access. So that means at two o'clock in the morning, you can actually access things like Find My Past by logging onto the library using your library card and accessing Find My Past through that online remote access. And in lockdown, this was brilliant because we had access to all of these search tools that were opened up to just about everybody, courtesy of the councils, uh, for us to be able to do research while we're in lockdown. So it was a marvellous thing. It's now reduced and come back to, um, I think, My Heritage and Find My Past as the only sites really available. Ancestry have made it available in the library, but uh, but not otherwise. And all of these sites operate the same sort of way as Family Search. You look for records, you look in the catalogue system, you look at family trees and look at information that other people have already published. And be aware, this is a bit of a joke, but this is actually quite real. <laughs> and I particularly can relate to this because uh, you will spend money on researching genealogy records and paying money for certificates. And ultimately, you will buy certificates and more certificates and more certificates to try and support your information about your family research journey. And it can cost you a little bit of money. So there's ways to actually circumvent spending all this money. And one of the ways is actually copying information that people have already published online. If they have already published a certificate online, then you are able, it's free and public domain, you're able to download that information directly to your computer without spending the money for that certificate. The secret is how do you go about finding that information online? So it can cost you to do this. So thank you. I'm out for time, people. So let's just take any questions if you have any, please. If uh, you'd like to just put your hand up or uh, unmute and ask, that's fine by me. Let's just unshare here. Thank you so much, Gary, for another wonderful presentation this morning. If anyone does have any questions, um, then please feel free to unmute yourselves. Otherwise, you can use the chat function just down the bottom of your screen, then we can answer those questions directly. I know we've got a question here in the chat from Adrian. I have done my DNA test by Ancestry and entered a basic family tree without subscribing to them. My two kids have used different suppliers for theirs and had quite different results. Yes. Is it logical to compare them? No, no, it's not. Okay. Because when you test on, uh, when you test with Ancestry, and you, um, I, I guess, Adrian, you're referring to your ethnicity estimates, uh, what it's coming back and saying you're 60% Scottish and 20% Irish and whatever. Those ethnicity estimates are only estimates. And when you do your DNA test on Ancestry, it will compare your DNA with other people that have tested on Ancestry. And it will give you that sort of comparison. People that test on with my heritage or 23andMe or whatever, it will only compare their DNA with the other results that are already on their website. So you will get di totally different ethnicity estimates coming back at you. But they are only estimates. They're just giving you hints of where your family may have actually come from. Uh, the detail, you know, the answer is in the detail of where it actually came from. And this is where Ancestry is actually the most powerful um, um, DNA tool to be able to start off with. Because if you do an Ancestry DNA test, you're able to take your Ancestry DNA test results and populate other websites with your DNA results. So you can send that DNA, your DNA, out to back into Ancestry attached to your family tree. You can set up a family tree on my heritage as a free family tree site and add your DNA, your ancestry DNA, into your my heritage family tree to have people on my heritage, you know, um, coming back to you. Because the idea of doing DNA is you want people to be able to access you, 
where can you find me? What can, what can we share? So uh, I hope that answers that question. Any else? There was also a second part um, of the question from Adrian. Um, their dad is long dead. Also, my mum is still alive. Is there any point in getting her DNA tested? Uh, yes, because you don't have anything else to go by. So you, you, you have to work with what you have. And if, if any, you're aiming for the, elder, the, the oldest possible living relative because you can't test them when they're dead. Any others? I can't, oh, I can see the chat. There's one here from Pat. Frequently, many of the papers passed are not available when searching. They are grayed out. Is there a good time of day to try ANS access papers passed? Um, when they're grayed out, I'm not quite, quite sure what you mean by that, Pat. Um, if, if there's a record or information showing, there's no time of the day where it's not available. Papers passed is online 24-7. Um, it, it would only be not available if it's not been digitized for the period that you're actually looking for. So you want to check the, um, the, the dates that you're actually searching for for the type of newspaper in that area, if it's Otago, then what was digitized and made available in Otago. Now, let's not get confused. The Otago newspapers were published extensively you know, for yonks and yonks and still are current but they've only been digitized up until recent years. So you want to look at the actual um, time frame on papers passed about what has been digitized and made available to you. That would be the only reason that it's being grayed out. Okay, anybody else? Nope. So you've covered everything off perfectly. Well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, thank you again. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, it has been certainly been really, really interesting and I'm sure you've got a lot out of it, everyone on the call. Um, so thank you again. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.